All right, we're gonna get started today with the seventh Psalm, a meditation of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. O Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me, lest they tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver. O Lord, my God, I have done this. If there is iniquity in my hands, if I have repaid evil to him or have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Yes, let him trample my life to the earth and lay my honor in the dust. Selah. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment you have commanded. So the congregation of the peoples shall surround you. For their sakes, therefore, return on high. The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God tests the hearts and minds, my defenses of God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out, and has fallen into the ditch which he has made. His trouble shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for your precious word, which tells us all the wonderful workings of you in time and in space that you created. And above all, it teaches us about Jesus who stepped out of eternity and put on robes of flesh and dwelt among us. And he is the source of all of our faith, all of our joy, all of our happiness. Help us to remember to put our eyes on him, to fix our thoughts on him, because he reveals you, the unseen God to us. Thank you for our Lord Jesus. Please be with us as we go through our service today. Uh, be with me and help me to properly handle your word so that I don't abuse it in any way, but bring glory to you instead. And be with each person here and help them to uh, uh, just enjoy what we have out here and enjoy the beautiful creation you've given us. All this to your honor and glory, we pray. And it's in the name of Jesus that we make this prayer. Amen. All right, I don't have many announcements today. I got just a couple things. As, uh, if you've never been baptized, we're going to talk about baptism today. Uh, some people tie baptism in with circumcision, and I'm going to give some thoughts about that. But if you've never been baptized and you'd like to be, uh, there's only two things that I'll ask you concerning that is, have you made a commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and are you willing to follow him in believer's baptism? And if so, there's plenty of water. We can go right out there and uh, uh, get baptized anytime. And um, also, I'd like to ask that people remember Paul and Elaine, who are our missionaries to Japan from Church on the Beach, uh, as they continue to do their uh, wonderful work over there. Their, their year is ending, I believe, in December, but uh, they may extend. You know, they've got decisions to make in the next couple months, and I just ask that you would remember them, keep them in your heart and prayers, and uh, just uh, know that they are doing the Lord's work over there, and it's a real joy. Um, one other announcement concerning today, and uh, anybody here that can't stay through the entire sermon I understand I may get a little long like I did on uh, Resurrection Day. If you remember, I got a little long on there. And that's because I'm going to take some passages of the Bible and go through them kind of as a part of the sermon. But uh, I, I can't really gauge how much I'm going to say until I've said it. And uh, so keep that in mind that if you need to go, I won't be offended. I won't be uh, in any way uh, uh, you know, bothered by that. I understand that you may have a time frame that you need to uh, stick to. And finally, um, there are mosquitoes out here, and we do have mosquito spray. So if anybody needs it, go to my wife right over there, and she'll uh, hand it to you because uh, they, they kind of do get brutal. But uh, other than that, I, there's one other announcement that I have to say just simply because it's almost like a prayer of thanks to the Lord is um, that last week we were here, and we actually had these clouds like we do now coming off of the uh, Gulf, and we didn't know if it was going to rain or not. And I don't know if Kelly here, she was here last week, if she paid attention to the rain pattern when she pulled out of here. But literally, on the other side of this RV park, not 300 feet going outside of Turtle Beach, it had rained. And it had rained pretty heavily. And it didn't rain a drop. I got one drop on my head here. 
during the service. And then by the time you get to my house, which is about a half a mile down the road, it was absolutely an inch of rain. It was just, it had poured. So I want to thank the Lord for that because he's done that to us several times over the past year where it's rained everywhere in Sarasota. Heavy, heavy rains. And people will call and say, are you canceling? I'll say, no, it's sunny out here. So Turtle Beach just seems to be a, a place graced by God for sermons. So I want to thank the Lord for that. Um, I uh, have one more thing to read from the Old Testament. We're not going to do a New Testament reading today. And the reason why is because, um, as I said, I'm going to be doing some reading from the Bible itself, and it comes right out of the New Testament, and it's in order from our normal New Testament reading which I did plan that way, and so it'll be part of the sermon. But I'd like to go ahead and read you the 144th Psalm real quickly. And uh, once we do that, then uh, we'll go ahead and get into the sermon portion of today. I'm trying to keep the beginning short so that we can, uh, you know, not have people run over on time, if possible, from the, uh, the sermon. Let's see here, Psalm 144. I should have bookmarked this, and I didn't, so. All right, Psalm 144, a Psalm of David. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness in my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him or the son of man that you are mindful of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains and they shall smoke. Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out your arrows and destroy them. Stretch out your hand from above. Rescue me and deliver me out of great waters. From the hand of foreigners whose mouth speaks lying words and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of ten strings I will sing praises to you. The one who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David his servant from the deadly sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speaks lying words and whose right hand is the right hand of falsehood, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as pillars sculpted in palace style, that our barns may be full, supplying all kinds of produce, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields, that our oxen may be well laden, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no outcry in our streets. Happy are the people who are in such a state, Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Okay, today we're going to talk on the subject of circumcision. This is Genesis 9, uh, 17, 9 through 14, which is only five verses. Uh, but before I do that, every week I like to give you this day in history. It's one of the things I've just come to love because I learn a lot from these things. And I also, after I figure out what happened on this day in history, I'll go back and I'll read about the accounts. And uh, so I get all kinds of little tidbits of uh, history from doing this. On this day in history, which is 12 August in 1851, which would have been, uh, let's see, 170, 171 years ago, I guess, a guy named Isaac Singer, if you know the name Singer, he uh, issued a patent for the double-headed sewing machine. And then in 1865, Disinfectant was used for the very first time during surgery by a guy named Joseph Lister. And I went online and I read all about Joseph Lister this morning. Yes, he was a Christian. He was a Quaker from England. And uh, if it weren't for him, you know, of course, uh, before, if you got a compound fracture where the bone actually stuck out of the, uh, the uh, skin, that was almost considered something that was required amputation. And now that's something that we just we have no problem with. So Joseph Lister did us a, a great service back then. In 1877, Thomas Edison invented the phonograph and made the first sound recording on this day. And does anybody remember what he did, what he recorded? Took a piece of wax paper and he spun it. And he... It was Mary Had a Little Lamb, if I remember. I think, I think that's what it was, but you might be right too. I don't know. Uh, uh, what, what's that? Oh, Graham Bell. Yeah, that's what he said. So I think it was Mary Had a Little Lamb. Uh, in 1898, the Spanish-American War was ended with the signing of the Peace Protocol. And at that time, the U.S. acquired Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines as territories, and they also annexed Hawaii at this time. Now, the Philippines has been given its own uh, sovereign state as a nation once again. Guam is still a territory. I've been to both of them. 
and Puerto Rico is a territory. I ate Puerto Rican food yesterday. I've never been there though. But uh, anyway, and then of course we know that Hawaii is our 50th state. So that happened in 1898. And then in 1964, as much as I dislike sports, I love human achievement. And so I have to bring this one up, that Mickey Mantle set a major league baseball record when he hit home runs from both the left and the right sides of the plate in one game. And you talk about it, just an amazing achievement that I had to bring up. So, uh, and then in 1985, something else happened. This was right outside of our house when I lived in Tokyo, it wasn't 20 miles away that a Japanese uh, airlines Boeing 747 crashed. It killed 520 people. It was the largest loss of life in an air crash, I believe to this day. And on that flight was a man named Q Sakamoto. Does anybody remember who he was? Q Sakamoto, he's the only person ever from Japan to record a song that became the number one song on the American Top 40 Billboard. And that was Sukiyaki, if you remember that song. And Q died on that airplane crash and uh, went off to meet his maker. And so the point about that is that none of us know when we are going to die. We do not know our last uh, moment of our, you know, maybe we're going to get on a plane and go back home next week. I know I got a friend here visiting from Chicago. Maybe we'll have a, a, a branch fall on our head today if the wind starts blowing. We don't know. And we have to be ready to meet the maker. And so please keep that in mind. And if you've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, it is the simplest thing to do. It is something that he just calls out to us and says, I've done these things for you and I will grant you eternal life by faith alone. And that is tied up in what we're gonna talk about today. Now I've said that I'm gonna be a little bit long today. I'm also going to be almost entirely on doctrine. I'm gonna speak very little about life application. And I know that people love to go to sermons that are life application, but you know me, that I believe that if you know doctrine, then you can apply the Bible to your life rather than taking your life and trying to insert it into the Bible. And this is one of the most important doctrines that we will come across in the Bible is circumcision. And you're gonna see why as we get through this. So please bear with me if I get a little long-winded, but what a beautiful thing. Uh, I'm gonna tie into it baptism, and I'm also gonna tie into circumcision grace by faith alone with no works required to please God. So if you can understand those two concepts, you'll understand why baptism is so important. And there are times that I will put a whole sermon together and I think, man, I just don't have enough information. That'll be on a long passage, like an entire chapter of the Bible. And then there are those times where I have just a couple of verses and I actually mourn over how much I have to leave out. And today is one of those days. We're gonna talk about five verses from Genesis and I am going to leave out so much on the subject of uh, circumcision throughout the Bible that it, it's almost appalling, but you can't do everything in a single sermon. But I want you to know how these things do tie together. The to topic in particular of circumcision without baptism, without grace by faith is so vast that we could take literally until late tonight and keep talking about it and answering questions and not even touch on it. It is such a big and vast subject, just these five verses. But I'm gonna go straight into the text verse for today and then we'll get into the sermon. Our text verse comes from Jeremiah 4.4. 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. Now remember, Jeremiah is under the law and he's speaking to people that are already circumcised, the Hebrew people. They're already circumcised in the flesh and he's saying, circumcise the foreskins of your hearts. You men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. You see, even in the Old Testament, circumcision was more than just a physical sign. It was something that was to be accompanied by an internal change of the heart away from the world and towards the things of God. And so may God speak to us through his word today and may his glorious name ever be praised. And that leads right to our first thought of the day, which is the covenant of circumcision. Now, before I get into that, when I posted that I was gonna be speaking on circumcision today on Facebook, one of the uh, professors from the seminary and Bible college that I attended up in North Carolina, posted a little uh, short video on there to kind of, uh, cause I was asking is infant baptism required or is full immersion baptism? And I didn't answer, I just asked the, the question rhetorically. And he posted this little video called Jim the Anabaptist 
firemen. So if you want to watch this video, just type it into YouTube and it'll come up. It's done by a Lutheran ministry. And what it is, is there's this guy standing outside of a building. There's people crying and wailing because the building is on fire and people are obviously dying in there. And you hear these screams and it's, you find out that it's a hospital. And another guy walks up to him and he says, um, uh, I'm glad you're here, Mr. Fireman. Uh, you need to take care of this building. And the, he says, uh, aren't you going to do anything? And he says, oh, sure, I'm going to do something. As soon as the, uh, the uh, children cry out to be saved, then I'll throw water on them. And uh, the point that this Lutheran ministry was making is that people that believe in full immersion baptism, which is something that comes after accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, are condemning these babies to hell because they're not willing to baptize them before they make a commitment to Jesus Christ. And the logic is appalling. I have to tell you that there's nothing biblical about that. It is unscriptural and it follows what was taught throughout the time of Roman Catholicism when it was the only church is that we will baptize infants and that will bring them into the covenant community as a substitute for circumcision of the Old Testament. And I'm gonna talk about that today and I hope that anybody that's watching on video won't get upset in the middle of something I say and not listen to the whole thing and see how it's put together. Because you have to understand the entire picture of what's going on in circumcision to understand whether that's true or not. But I was personally offended by that video that somebody would think that I'm not going to try to uh, bring every soul possible to salvation and to eternal glory through Jesus Christ's blood. And so I posted on there, uh, not a nice comment, there wasn't anything uh, uh, bad in it, but I, I, I wasn't very nice in what I said about their crummy theology. But there we go. I just wanted you to know that this is the doctrine of most Re Reformation churches, Lutherans and Presbyterians and Episcopals and the Roman Catholics uh, before the Reformation. These churches believe in infant baptism as a replacement for circumcision. Now, last week we talked about Genesis 1 through 17, 1 through 8. And what I want to do is I want to read those nine verses or those eight verses to you again so that you have a context for today's sermon. Here we go. When Avram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Avram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and multiply you exceedingly. Then Avram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me. Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Avram, for your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be your God and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you in the land which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession and I will be their God. So Avraham with his new name and his new identity has had the promise from 25 years earlier when he came into the promised land restated once again and new details were added. The Lord is moving in his perfect timing and he is preparing a great new beginning for his chosen servant. We come to verse nine. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. Now in our sermon verses last week, verse four said, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. After saying this, the Lord renamed Avram to Abraham and restated and he refined his promises to him. In the process, we read the word my or I seven times. This was the Lord's promises and this was his vow. Now he says to Abraham, as for you, the conditions that God expects are laid out in verses nine through 14. The very first thing we see in them is that the conditions apply not only to Abraham, but to his descendants after him in the following generations. Verse 10. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Now circumcision is the sign of the covenant that God mandates. Last week, we established that he is the father and we are heirs of Abraham when we call on Jesus as Lord. We are his spiritual descendants. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter three. Now, if this is so, 
If we are descendants of Abraham spiritually, then what God mandates to Abraham could be interpreted as being mandated to us in the church as well. The question before you is, and this is rhetorical, you don't have to answer, if we are Abraham's descendants by faith, and all of Abraham's male descendants must be circumcised, then are we in the church required to circumcise our children, our male children in the flesh? This is a very confusing issue for many, and there are sects and there are denominations that without taking the time to understand our position in Jesus Christ actually mandate that you must circumcise your children. Can you defend why this is wrong? What I'd like you to do is to just try to pay attention if possible. I know I'm gonna say a lot today, but hopefully you will understand where the error in this lies. Remember our great rule of interpretation. I've given you several, but the great rule of interpretation is context, context, context. And just to make sure that you keep things in context, add in a couple more, okay? Add in lots of contexts. If we keep things in context, then we will keep from the error of heresy. And mandating circumcision to meet the requirements of the law for a Christian is, according to Paul, heresy. Now I wanna take just a second and explain to you the difference between heresy and bad doctrine. Bad doctrine is not always a heresy. There's something called Praetorism, which believes that everything in the book of Revelation has been fulfilled with the exception of the return of Jesus Christ. That's not a heresy, that's just bad doctrine, okay? A heresy is a little bit different. Bad doctrine can lead to a loss of joy in the church, but a heresy can lead to a loss of salvation. Teaching a heresy does not necessarily mean a heretic. A person that teaches a heresy is not necessarily a person that is not saved but a person that teaches a heresy keeps the next person from being saved. And I'm gonna give you an example so that you understand this. If I go to Papua New Guinea and I teach somebody about Jesus and I say, he is the Lord and he alone can save you from sin and reconcile you to God the Father. And he says, okay, I accept that, I believe that. That person is now a saved believer in Jesus Christ. Somebody comes along later, say a Mormon church moves in and they give them Mormon doctrine and this person doesn't have anything to stand on other than his proclamation of Jesus. And so he accepts Mormon doctrine that we will someday become gods ourselves and run our own little universe and Mormonism, in other words, is a polytheistic religion. Well, he teaches these things. He's already been saved by Christ. He is under the blood of Christ and he can never lose that salvation. But now he's teaching other people things that will keep them from being saved. So being a heretic does not necessarily preclude you from being saved but it does preclude the next person from being saved. So be very careful about understanding the differences between bad doctrine and heresy and what heresy does lead to. Now we wanna take a moment and think about the covenant that God made with Noah. And we wanna see the difference between that covenant and the one that is made here with Abraham. Noah's covenant was one-sided and it was unconditional. God says, I will never again flood the world as I have. I'll never destroy every living thing as I have had. And then he gave them a sign. Does anybody remember what the sign of the covenant of Noah was? Rainbow. Now, think about this. The rainbow is a natural phenomena. Man does not participate in that sign. It is something that is from God and we have no control over it. All right. In the same way now, the covenant to Abraham's descendants was given on an oath. The physical descendants of Abraham are the recipients of the covenant. Regarding the land, there were no strings attached to it. He made a promise, this land is to you and your descendants, and that is unconditional. However, God is now making a, I don't want to call it a condition, but he's making a, uh, uh, we'll call it a condition just because I can't think of a good word. He's making a conditional to the people who would receive the promises that are made to Abraham. The, this change does not take away the land covenant, but it defines those who qualify to receive it. So let's think of it this way. I'm gonna give you an example to help you think this through. A jillionaire, and that's a person that has a jillion dollars. He comes to Siesta Key and he finds me on the beach and he says, to you and to your descendants, I am going to give you this beautiful island known as Siesta Key. This is unconditional and it's one-sided. This has occurred with Abraham since Genesis 12. All the way since back there, this is what God has promised. To you and your descendants, you will get this land. Later, 
the same jillionaire, this person that has a jillion dollars, comes to me and he says, this is the sign of the covenant. Every one of your male descendants will have a beard. Anyone without a beard will be excluded from the promise. So Mike is excluded and Roy is part of it because he has a beard and he doesn't. The land promise has not changed. The land is still given to me and to my descendants, but those who are actually entitled to it have certain obligations. If only one of my descendants grows a beard, then only one will get the land. But the land still belongs to me and to my descendants after me. If they all grow a beard, like Tony, if he goes and grows his beard back, then he can live here. Now, I hope this clears us up. Unlike the promise to Noah, which was unconditional, and the earlier promises to Abraham, which were also unconditional, the clarification of this promise defines the parameters, and they are voluntary. In this verse, there is a responsibility in the individual toward the word of promise. An assent to the promise allows its fulfillment. If one of my descendants doesn't want to be handsome like me, then he doesn't get to live on beautiful siesta key. And that leads us to verse 11. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Circumcision for the purposes of the covenant is to be in the flesh of the foreskins. This is the sign that brings males into the covenant. And it is the longest continually practiced ceremony pertaining to a covenant on earth today. It is so inextricably tied to the covenant that in the book of Acts, Stephen calls it the covenant of circumcision. But there's something to note. Not everyone who is circumcised is a member of the covenant. There have been, and there are even today, groups of people in the world that circumcise their children, but they do not qualify. And we're gonna discuss why in the coming verses. I'm gonna let this plane pass by here. Oh, it's a helicopter. Hang on, people, I'll get to you in a second. All right, helicopter's gone. Verse 12, he who is 80 days old among, eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. Muslims circumcise their children, but they are not inheritors of this promise. Does anybody here know why? There are a couple of reasons. First, the promise was after given to Abraham, it was given to only one son, Isaac, not Ishmael. And then it was given to Jacob, but not his brother Esau. Only the promised line receives the promises of the covenant, which is the land promise. But even if some of them did descend from these two, they still would not be entitled because Muslims circumcise their children without regard to a specific age. They do it anywhere from birth all the way up to 18 years of age. And if I was 18, I would not want to go through that. I'll tell you that. But some, some Muslims in Indonesia practice that. They are excluded from the promise because they do not participate in it. For the covenant sons of Abraham, circumcision of the foreskin is not just mandated to bring somebody into the covenant, but there are specific procedures which accompany the rite. The first is that it is to be accomplished on the child when he's eight days old. Now the number eight in the Bible is consistently used for new beginnings. It's a picture of a new beginning in the life of this family and of this child. Here's a good example for you. There were eight people on the Ark of Noah, all which entered the new life. They got through the flood and they entered the new life, which is a picture of the resurrection. The covenant with Abraham is mentioned specifically eight times between God and Abraham. And the eighth time is at the binding of his son Isaac when he was asked to sacrifice him, which is again a picture of the resurrection. As a matter of fact, it's explicitly said that in the book of Hebrews. And then we have Joseph. He spoke with his brothers eight times. And on the eighth time, his brothers met with him. It was in Genesis chapter 50, and it was another veiled picture of a new beginning. We could go on with this number throughout the Bible again and again and again. I mean, we could be here for hours talking about the number eight, but it is very clear that the Bible spiritually signifies new beginnings when the number eight is used. However, 
The eighth day also has physical significance, something that wasn't discovered until the middle of the 20th century. This is what the Apologetics Press reports from a article that was found, uh, published in 1953. Holt Pediatrics observed that a newborn infant has a per peculiar susceptibility to bleeding between the second and fifth days of life. Hemorrhages at this time, though often inconsequential, are sometimes extensive. They may produce serious damage to internal organisms or organs, especially to the brain, and cause death from shock and exsanguination. Obviously then, if vitamin K is not produced in sufficient quantities until days five through seven, it would be wise to postpone any surgery until sometime after that. But why did God specify day eight? On the eighth day, the amount of prothrombin present actually is elevated above 100% of normal. And this is the only day in the male's life in which this will be the case under normal conditions. If surgery is to be performed, day eight is the perfect day to do it. Vitamin K and prothrombin levels are at their peak. Dr. Milo McMillan observed that we should commend the many hundreds of workers who labored at great expense over numbers of years to discover that the safest day to perform circumcision is the eighth. Yet, as we congratulate medical science for this recent finding, we can almost hear the leaves of the Bible rustling. They would like to remind us that 4,000 years ago, when God initiated circumcision, Abraham did not pick the eighth day after many centuries of trial and error experiments. Neither he nor any of his company from the ancient city of Ur and the Chaldees had ever been circumcised. It was a day picked by the creator of vitamin K. Even in this seemingly bloody ritual of circumcision, we have a display of the wisdom of the creator and his tending to the health and the welfare of his covenant people. If this is how God treats the physical nature of his people, how much more sure and reliable will he treat the spiritual promises that he makes to each person who calls on the name of Jesus Christ? But there's something that is important for us to consider in circumcision that can help us with our own Christian family. So keep this in mind, starting with Abraham, but following through every generation since, the parent, the parent is the one who is responsible for circumcising the child. The child is a passive, yes, a painful, but a passive recipient in this rite. If we look at this example of the Hebrew people, we can understand why they have held together as a covenant community for the past 4,000 years. It was because they are acknowledging their responsibility to this covenant and demonstrating a hope in the promises that it holds. If we, as faithful Christians, act in the same responsible manner, especially towards our children, we can trust that families will be equally blessed. This is not talking about physical blessings either. I'm not talking about becoming a wealthy person, but the blessings of knowing that our children will be a part of the spiritual heritage which Christ established for us. We, as parents, we have the responsibility to raise our children in a godly manner. Just as the Hebrews were faithful to circumcise their children, just as they were asked. And when we do this, we have the hope that Christ will take hold of them and he will carry them through to his eternal dwelling. Now, I wanna make sure that everybody understands that there are no ultimate guarantees here because every person, every child you raise, either in a godly or in an ungodly home has free will. But by following the guidelines of the Bible, we have a much stronger hope than if we neglect our responsibility as Christian parents. Verse 13, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. My covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Himmel yimmel yelid betecha. In circumcising, you shall circumcise. This repetition of saying this is used to denote the absolute necessity of doing it and the care to be followed in the practice. There were to be no uncircumcised males anywhere in that household. Every male that is born in the house or that is purchased as a servant or a slave must be circumcised. And unless you understand what circumcision symbolizes, this passage might not make much sense to you. 
but in a few minutes, I hope that it will, and I hope that it is something that you will never, never forget concerning circumcision. This same rule, though, that was given to Abraham is the same concept of rule that is given to us. Actually, it was given to the apostles and passed down to us when Jesus said that we are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And it is for this reason that many churches base their membership on having been baptized, and that by full immersion. Unfortunately, too many churches have put the horse in front of the cart because they baptize infants as a sort of New Testament substitute for this Old Testament rite. But there's a couple things to think about. These children are not members of the covenant of faith. They've never called out on Jesus Christ as Lord, nor are they members of Israel, which is a covenant in the flesh. Baptism, and I'm going to demonstrate this as we go through here, can in no way be considered a replacement for circumcision in the family life of Christians, as you will clearly see. The only way, and the Bible makes this absolutely clear, that you can become a child of God is by the mental assertion and the vocal pronouncement that Jesus Christ is Lord. Only after this is baptism a recognizable tenet of the inner conversion. The only thing that baptism of infants does is promote false security in a person that may not have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's exactly what that video that I brought up at the beginning of this talk does. They're saying this is saving children. And I can tell you that Charlie Garrett was baptized in a church right down the road about 47 years ago. And all my life, up until I was 37, 36 years old, I thought, I'm a Christian. I was baptized and my parents are Christians, therefore I'm a Christian. And it took understanding what God is telling us in his word to find out that that is the furthest thing from the truth. Infant baptism is giving us false security. A second problem comparing infant baptism to circumcision is the obvious overlooking of something. Does anybody know what I'm coming, gonna come to? Abraham was told to circumcise every male. It's overlooking women. If this right of circumcision applies only to males, then how do we get infant baptism of males and females out of it? If we were to carry this concept through, which is the logical thing to do, as much of the church has done, then we would simply skip the baptizing of female infants. But this would be as unscriptural as baptizing infants in the first place. The entire purpose of circumcision has a greater fulfillment in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ, and it looks forward to him. Therefore, it cannot be equated with infant baptism. To understand this ancient rite more fully, pay attention in just the next few minutes, and we will discover the symbolism that looks all the way back to Genesis 3.15 and the fall of man, and it looks forward all the way to the restoration of that fall when Jesus Christ hung on a cross. Verse 14, and the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. The law for the people was circumcision, but it was the parent who had the responsibility for circumcising this child on the eighth day. In this verse, we see the consequences of the parent's decision affecting the children and the owner's decision affecting his servants. In such a case, we'd also see the failure of the entire society at large because anyone who knew that this child was uncircumcised, including the priests who were supposed to perform this rite, would be guilty of negligence. This is actually a way of keeping the entire corporate body accountable to each other. And this, once again, does find a parallel in the New Testament. In the book of 1 Corinthians, it talks about church discipline, and in particular, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If people do not meet the requirements of the church, there is a corporate responsibility within the church of ensuring that they're disciplined. And that is hopefully to lead to repentance so that we act in a manner in which the Lord is laid out for us in the Bible. So there is that parallel. About this particular verse, verse 14, Adam Clark says this, it was impossible for a person who had not received the spiritual purification to enter into eternal glory. The spirit of this law extends to all ages, dispensations, and people. He whose heart is not purified from sin cannot enter into 
the kingdom of God. And that brings us to our second thought today, which is shadows of the coming Messiah. The questions that we should ask ourselves right now are this. Why was there no requirement on women? Why is circumcision given and it only pertains to men? What is God doing this for? In other words, why wasn't there a physical sign that was given that could have been more obviously seen by other people, like a tattoo maybe or a certain hairstyle? And why only cut males? And why only do it in such a personal and intimate way? The answer to this goes, as I said, all the way back to Genesis 3.15, a verse known as the Proto-Evangelium or the first gospel. When God cursed the serpent, he said these words to him, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We learned right in the very first pages of the Bible that a human being was going to come and he was going to redeem man, but that he would be from the seed of the woman. What is implicitly stated right there and which is explicitly stated in the book of 1 Corinthians is that sin came from one man. What is implicit in circumcision is that it also comes through man. In other words, sin is transferred from us through man. By cutting the male organ in the rite of circumcision, a picture was made of the cutting away of sin. This is why even those who were purchased as slaves were to be circumcised. It's a picture of cutting away the transfer of sin within the covenant community. But like so many other pictures in the Bible, it is just a picture. The sin still transfers from the father to the child. And all people, all people, whether you're a male or a female, have inherited your sin from your father because all people have a father. Thus, there was the need for a father without sin in order for there to be a child without sin. Sin transfers through the man, but Jesus was born sinless because he was born of God, the father and of Mary, but not having a human father, he did not inherit his father's sin. However, in order to prevail over sin, he would have to live a sinless life as well. If he failed, he would not have been qualified as a substitute for Adam. The reason why is Adam was created without sin. He fell during his life. Just because Jesus was born without sin does not mean that he would prevail. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that proves that Jesus was born of God. It also proves that he was not only born sinless, but he also lived a sinless life. You see, the resurrection is 100% conditional on the virgin birth. No virgin birth equals no resurrection. And how can we know that 100%? We know this absolutely because babies that die do not resurrect. If this weren't true, then babies that had never committed a sin would come back to life, but they don't. Sin is inherited through the father. However, the virgin birth does not guarantee the resurrection, nor does living a sinless life if one is not virgin born. Both the virgin birth and the sinless life are conditions for the resurrection. If Jesus was not born of a virgin, he would have inherited his father's sin, Adam's sin. But even though he was born of a virgin, he still needed to live perfectly sinless throughout his entire life. Now, I'm gonna give you two arguments and I want you to listen to them and I'm gonna post them on this video so that you can follow them. The resurrection is conditional upon a sinless life. A sinless life is conditional upon the virgin birth. Therefore, the resurrection proves the virgin birth. The resurrection, this is our second argument, the resurrection proves a virgin birth. The virgin birth proves that Jesus was born of God and of Mary. Therefore, Jesus is God's son. He is the God man. If you can grasp this, then you can see why God gave the people who would usher the Messiah into the world a picture of what was coming, one who would be born without sin. And hopefully you can see now why baptism did not replace circumcision as a sign for the covenant community and why infant baptism is a pointless gesture. As one final validation that it is, 
that infant baptism is not a replacement for circumcision. All we need to do is go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's what Paul writes. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers, meaning the Hebrews, were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized in the Moses, in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Paul says that these Hebrews, their men that were already circumcised, were also baptized into Moses. Therefore, these are two distinct and separate concepts. Baptism cannot be a replacement for circumcision. Both men and women come from Adam, and they receive his sin through the Father. And therefore, both men and women receive baptism, and that only after accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Children of believers are already sanctified by the believing parent. That's right in the Bible. It's in the book of 1 Corinthians once, once again. It's chapter 7, and it's the 14th verse. Children of believers are sanctified through the believing parent. So infant baptism is simply a waste of time and is something that causes false security. I don't know if my brother felt that way walking around all those years before he met the Lord, but that's how I felt. Oh, I've been baptized. I'm a Christian. That's all that does for you. As Peter states in his first epistle when speaking of the regeneration by the Spirit, this is Peter writing about this very issue, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Now you think that that means get baptized and you're saved. That's not what he's talking about, and he explains it right here. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, meaning water baptism, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The internal change that occurs is what saves us. Baptism, which is the regeneration of the Holy Spirit by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is that thing. That's recorded in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. It says, when you call on the name of Jesus Christ, when you believe in him, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The moment you believe is the moment you receive. And this regeneration only happens after accepting Christ, not before. So if you have never been baptized since your conversion as a Christian, today may be a good time to think about it. If you're watching on video and you've never been baptized, please have your pastor at your church baptize you. All right? And Colossians chapter 2, Paul sums this concept up. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. He's saying that it is faith which saves you and that circumcision has no bearing on your salvation. He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Where was I? I got distracted here. He has made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And what's he speaking about there? The handwriting of the requirements is the law of Moses. He says that he has taken that away. He's completely taken away the law of Moses. It's contrary to us. And he says he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, here's a question. Did Jesus take the law of Moses on a parchment and nail it to the cross? The answer is no. He fulfilled that law on our behalf. And then his body, which was the fulfillment of that law, was nailed to the cross. He took the law away and he nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities, and powers he made a public spectacle over them triumphing over them in it it is the cross of jesus christ which brings us near to god not water baptism when we get baptized out there we are simply saying i want to follow the lord and i want to show the world that i have been baptized I, or i have received him and i want the world to see it by this picture that i'm making of the inner conversion i've already had all right that brings us to our third thought today, the blessedness of grace through faith. And I told you we wouldn't have a New Testament reading today. Here it is. This is going to be Romans chapter 4, and I will try to keep it short, but it's very, very interesting. What shall we say then that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? 
That's speaking of the circumcision of Abraham. He's asking a rhetorical question. What do we say about that? What is it that circumcision did for him? Did it somehow save him? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. If I do something for my son over here or for anybody on the street and I do something good, then I can say, look at the great thing I did. I boasted. But Paul says, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Now, I want to, I was thinking about this just as this morning as I was looking it over. He says, what does the scripture say? If you want to be close and personal with Jesus Christ, there's only one way to do it. And that is to know your Bible. Your walk and your closeness with Jesus Christ is only as close as you are to him by knowing his word. I'm sorry for people that attend charismatic churches that believe that God is going to somehow give them a revelation of Jesus Christ without reading their Bible. That will never, 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 never happen. God has revealed himself through his word. And Paul again and again and again says, go to the scriptures to understand what is being explained. And now he, we have his words, which explain these things as well. All right, so he says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and he accounted it to him for righteousness. We did that sermon about five or six or seven weeks ago. It was Genesis 15 and that was verse six that he just quoted. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Remember, he walked him outside and he says, look up, if you can count the stars, thus shall your descendants be. And it says, Abraham believed God and God credited to him for righteousness. At that very moment, Abraham was declared righteous. Now to him who works, talking about anybody that does something, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. If Kelly cuts somebody's hair because she's a hairstylist and they pay her, was that grace or was that debt? It was debt. She did something for them, now they owe something to her. If somebody walks down the road passing Bill while he's here on vacation and they hand him a million dollars and say, this is for you and they walk away, is that grace or is that debt? That is grace. He did nothing to deserve it. And what I do is I'd say, Bill, you need to give me half because I'm such a good looking guy. But it, and he would, because he's such a nice guy. The whole point is what he's making here is that to a person that works, meaning anything, anything you do, wages are counted, not as grace, but as a debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. That's what happened to Abraham. Look up, count the stars if you can, thus shall your descendants be, you are righteous. He's saying that that is apart from works. And now he's gonna do something that is astonishing. This is Paul writing from the Old Testament He's going to quote David. Listen to what he does here. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Was David under the law or was he before the law? David was under the law. He was a member of the covenant community of Israel in Israel under the law. And yet David writes this. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. But David is under the law. If David is under the law and he's saying that people that are blessed who don't have sin imputed, then how can that be? Because he's under the law. Where does that come from? It comes from one day in the Hebrew calendar every year. It's called the Day of Atonement. Why did they need a Day of Atonement? It's because nobody can meet the requirements of the law. Paul's already made that clear. He says, if you do these things, you shall live by them. And then he goes on to say that nobody can do these things. It is impossible for us to fulfill the law. Absolutely impossible. But if you do these things, you will live by them, which means nobody is going to live because of the law. So what did God do in his grace and his mercy? He gave them the day of atonement. And now we're gonna explain this a little bit here. It says that blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Well, how are their sins covered? It was symbolically done by killing an animal, cutting its throat, taking the blood behind the veil and wiping it and putting it on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. That symbolically covered their sins. It took away God's wrath for another year. But here's another problem. It says in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. If that's the case, then what is taking away their sin? which we know is taken away because David says, blessed is the man whose sin is not imputed to him. What is taking away the sin? What? The blood of Christ. Faith 
in what Christ is going to do. It is by faith and faith alone that a person is saved, even under the law. Do you see what he's doing? He's taking a person that was saved before the law, and now he's taking a person that's saved under the law, and they are both saved in the same way. And here's an example. I go down to Jerusalem with my lovely wife, and we go down there and we do what the law says, confess your sins before the Lord. Actually, it says only the men, but we'll say my wife is going down there with me, and we confess our sins before the Lord, right? And I am thinking in my heart, oh God, I have broken your law, and I am condemned as a sinner, and I trust that this act that you are doing behind the veil today is going to take away my sin. I am going to go back to my home and I will be forgiven for another year. And my wife who goes there and says, gee, this is so stupid. This is just a pointless waste of my time. I could be home knitting and sewing and she's not forgiven because she has not had faith in the promises of God. Now, once again, only males were required to go down there, but the point is made that you are forgiven by faith both under the law and both apart from the law. And he's going to continue to build on this. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? David was circumcised. He was under the law of Moses. And he says, blessed is everyone who God doesn't impute sin, right? And Paul asks, does that only apply to circumcised people? Or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. And he asks the question, how was it accounted? While he was circumcised or while he was uncircumcised? He was accounted for righteousness in Genesis 15, 6. Many years later, he's given the covenant of circumcision in Genesis 17. Not while circumcised, but by while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, which is a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. He was saved by faith, and all this is is a sign and a seal of that faith. And then he goes on to say that he, meaning Abraham, might be the father of all those who believed, though are uncircumcised. So if anybody here is called on Jesus Christ and said, I know that I'm a sinner and I need you to forgive me, and you are uncircumcised, Abraham is your father by faith alone. That the righteousness might be imputed to them, the uncircumcised also and the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. And that goes back exactly to what I said about David. David is circumcised. He slept with the person's wife. He committed adultery. And then he had that man killed. The law says that you are condemned because of that. But the law also gives a provision for being forgiven. And he had faith. He wasn't just circumcised. He had faith that the Day of Atonement would cover his sins. So Abraham is the father of all who are uncircumcised and have faith, and also those who are circumcised and have faith. It doesn't make any difference if you are circumcised or not. As a matter of fact, Paul is going to say that circumcision means nothing. And I'll get to that in a couple minutes. Now he goes here in verse 13, and he says, for the promise that he would be heir of the world, Abraham, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The law was 430 years later. For if those who are of the law, 430 years later, are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect. But the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. The law says you cannot eat pork, you cannot eat shellfish. And I eat pork or I eat shellfish, Wrath has come upon me. Whereas this guy over in Nowheresville that wasn't a part of the covenant community is out eating pork and he's committed no offense because there's no law to say that you're committing offense. So the law, as I've said, sermon after sermon has two overarching purposes. The first is to show us how utterly sinful sin is before God. This is God's standard, it's the law. And we can't meet it. And it shows us how utterly sinful we are before God. And the second one is to say, I need something greater than the law. And that is the person of Jesus Christ who fulfilled the law and then he had it nailed to the cross in his body. That is the purpose of the law being given to us. Therefore, it is of faith, faith of Abraham, that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law like David, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, and this is from last week's sermon, I have made you a father of many nations. In one verse, I think it was verse four, he said, I shall make you the father of many nations. 
And then he changes his name from Avram to Abraham. And in one verse, it says, I have made you the father of many nations. In one verse, in the simple changing of his name, the conversion was made. And it says, in the presence of him, God, whom he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Paul brings up a point about creation right there. God spoke the universe into existence. That's what the Bible teaches. And we have to have faith in that. We have to have faith that that actually happened. We can reason it through to a point, but we have to actually have faith, especially in today's world, when we have these people that are saying, no, the universe created itself, which is a logical impossibility because it would have to exist before it existed. But he's saying that he calls things which do not exist as though they did. And that creation is a picture of each one of us because our faith doesn't exist until it exists. And God calls it into existence. Who contrary to hope, in hope believe that he might become the father of many nations. I'll go quickly from here down through Romans 4. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, meaning Abraham, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. Remember last week he was 99 years old when he was told this. And He's going to have a son at 100 years of age. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, they've been married for over 50 years and they still haven't had a child. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced that he had, pro had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him as righteousness. All of this talk about Abraham and his faith, the righteousness is imputed for that righteousness, for that faith. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered because of our justification, nailed him to the cross. He was delivered for our justification. I'm sorry, he was delivered because of our offenses. Remember what it said, the law brings about wrath. He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised because of our justification. In one great act of God, he both delivered us from the law and he justified us in the body of Jesus Christ. That's Romans 4. I've got a couple more verses to read you from uh, Corinthians, Galatians, and Philippians, and I'll be done. But these are very important, and they will tie what he just said in Romans together. The first is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, this starting with verse 17. And what he's been doing is he's been talking about marriage, males and females, and different positions that we are in in our life. And he says, but as God distributed to each one, the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? If you are a, a, a person, you're already circumcised and God has called you as a believer. He says, let him not become uncircumcised. You don't need to sew anything back on, okay? Was anyone called while uncircumcised. Suppose there's somebody here that is uncircumcised and Jesus Christ calls them. They call on Jesus as Lord and Savior. He says, let him not be circumcised. And it is going to be very, very important to understand why when I get to the book of Galatians. Very important. Don't become circumcised. Circumcision is, and I said this earlier, nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Uncircumcised, stay uncircumcised. Circumcised, don't become uncircumcised. Okay? And then he says, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. And all of a sudden, people think, I got to keep the commandments of God. And what do they do? They go back to the law of Moses, which he's just been saying is nailed to the cross. The commandments of God can be summed up in one verse from the book of 1 John chapter 6. It says here in the 29th verse, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. That one verse sums up everything that we need to know about the commandments of God. If we trust in Jesus Christ, everything else will follow suit. Not worrying about eating pork, not worrying about Saturday Sabbath, not worrying about anything that's under the law, but rather only trusting in Jesus Christ and believing in him whom God has sent. All right, now we're going to go to the book of Galatians. This is the fifth chapter. Paul has been talking about the Judaizers, people that come in and say, you need to do this in order to be saved. You need to do this in order to be saved. You need to stop eating pork. You need to no more dancing. 
no more drinking, no more this, and no more that. And here's what he says, stand fast. Stand fast means to be absolutely immovable. You're on vacation and you go to a church, say you go to a Seventh-day Adventist church, and they say, well, where do you normally attend? Well, I attend Grace Baptist in Sarasota. And they say, well, that's not a, a Sabbath worshiping church. You need to worship on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. And if you don't, you're gonna go to hell. And they say, and I bet you eat pork too. And you say, of course I eat pork. And they say, well, you can't eat pork. And all of a sudden you start worrying about all these things that are under the law. And you're saying, well, what are you talking about? Because you haven't read your Bible and you don't know what the Bible says about our freedom in Jesus Christ. And you start worrying and you say, uh oh, I guess I better spend all day on, on the Sabbath day on Saturday in church or I'm gonna go to hell. And I guess I better stop eating pork or I'm gonna go to hell. And you say, oh, I guess I better be circumcised or I can't be saved. And Paul is going to tell you right now what the consequences of that are. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Paul, throughout his writings, calls the law of Moses bondage. Even in the book of Acts, it's called bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, somebody tells you you need to be circumcised in order to meet God's requirements after calling on Jesus Christ, here's what he says. Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man that becomes circumcised. And I'm not talking about if you just want to be circumcised for health reasons, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in order to merit God's favor. You've called on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he has saved you. And now you try to do something to buy God's favor. He says this, I testify to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. 613 laws within the law of Moses, and you have to keep every single one of them perfectly. And if you don't, then you have failed because you've already given up on the grace of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying. You are a debtor to the entire law. You have become estranged from Christ. Does that mean Christ is over here? I just turned my back on him. That's what you've done. And God expects you for the rest of your life to fulfill the law perfectly. And you can't, and you're going to get no credit from him for the good deeds that you've done because you have set aside the grace in Christ. You haven't lost your salvation, but you will lose your joy, I assure you. It says, you have been estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, meaning the moment you call on Jesus, you receive, I said it earlier, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you believe, you receive. Through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith not by deeds of the law, not by stopping dancing, not by giving up drinking or whatever it is that bothers you that somebody tells you you need to be doing. You are free in Jesus Christ. Then it says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And it'll bring us to our last portion of scripture today, which is from Philippians 3, 2, 1. And I'm including this to show you who would have the most reason to boast in the works of the law. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. People that are telling you you have to do all these crazy things. And then he says, beware of the mutilation. What he's talking about is somebody that says you need to be circumcised. That's mutilating your body, according to Paul, because that's set aside in Christ. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And isn't infant baptism such confidence? Isn't that it? If you think about it, you have no confidence in the flesh. Well, what were the Hebrews doing? They were saying, I am circumcised and therefore I'm right with God. And people that baptize infants are boasting in the flesh. I was circumcised, or I'm sorry, I was infant baptized. And that was me for 36 years of my life. So be sure that you have these categories separated though I also might have confidence in the flesh. Here it comes, here's Paul's great boasting. If anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day, exactly what we've been reading about today. That was a requirement of Abraham. But remember now, Abraham had other sons. He had Ishmael and he had other sons from his wife Keturah. He had all these children, they were all circumcised on the eighth day. So Paul defines it even more. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Not only am I like those other people, I'm like the covenant line that came from Isaac and then my father Jacob who became Israel and then my father who is, listen to this, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now why did he bring in Benjamin? 
it's just one of the 12 tribes. Well, I can tell you it was one of the greatest of the 12 tribes. Benjamin was one of only two tribes that did not get separated during the division of Israel into the northern and southern kingdoms. There were two tribes that were left, Judah and Benjamin. And they stayed faithful and they were down in the southern kingdom. When King David was rebelled against by his uh, son Absalom, Benjamin stuck with David during that war. Benjamin is the tribe where the first king of Israel came from, Saul, who later was replaced by King David. Benjamin was also the tribe that became the smallest tribe of all. When they did something wrong, Israel came against them and they killed all of the Benjamites except for 600 men. And this is the tribe that Paul is from. He's saying, I am not only circumcised on the eighth day, I'm not only of the stock of Israel, but I am of the tribe of Benjamin. And then he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Of all of the people out there, I am the greatest of all of the Hebrews. And concerning the law, a Pharisee. He had to know by memory the first five books of the Bible, the law of Moses. He knew everything about it. He was, and what does he say about that law now? He said, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He's the one that stood there and guarded the coats of the people that martyred the very first person in the church age, Stephen. And Paul went, he was given letters to go to other areas in Israel and to arrest people that had called on Jesus and bring them back for trial. And he even went out of the country to do this. He was zealous for the law of Moses. And he says, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. It makes me think of the guy that walked up to Jesus and he said, Jesus, what do I need to do to be saved? And Jesus said, this and this and this and this and this. And the guy says, I've done all those since I was a boy. And he says, one more thing you need to do. He says, sell all of your goods and go give it to the poor and follow me. And you will, I don't want to misquote it, but you remember that parable, okay? Or that story of this person that did that. That was Paul. Now, I'm not saying that was literally Paul, but that was him. I've done everything perfectly before the law. And it means nothing. He says, concerning the law, blameless. But what these things were gain to me, I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. And he uses a word in the Greek, skibala, which means dung. Now, I don't want to use a worse word than that, but that's the word that he uses. Everything that I was and all of the things that I earned under the law are dung compared to knowing Jesus Christ, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which are all the things that he had done, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And that is what Paul lays every single bit of his hope on is Jesus Christ alone. All of the things that he counted as gain once were nothing but dung. And he put his hope in Jesus Christ. And so give me one minute to explain very quickly in simple terms why Jesus came in case somebody here has never called on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's why we die is because we have sinned and we have earned death. Remember we were talking about wages for Kelly cutting hair and grace for him getting a million dollars. The wages of sin is death. But the Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I have earned death, but God offers me a gift. It's something I can't pay for. And in fact, if I try to pay for it, like circumcision or anything else, I'm gonna offend God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it says that God demonstrates his own love towards us, people that have violated God's perfect standard, and that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. He took that law that we deserve, and he nailed it to the cross and all of the wrath that comes along with that law. It's all nailed to the cross in the body of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave the gift. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God asks you to do one simple thing. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And if you don't, you will be condemned. As a matter of fact, you're condemned already according to Jesus' own words. 
please, if you've never called on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, make today the day. And if you've never been baptized by full immersion, I'll do it anytime, any day of the week, anywhere. I'm gonna ask you two simple questions. Have you called on Jesus as Lord? And do you wanna follow him in believer's baptism? Last thing of the day, I do it every week. I write a poem on this, the verses that we talked about. Today it's Genesis 17 verses nine through 14, I think. This is called the covenant of circumcision. God said to Abraham, this is what he did say. As for you, you shall keep my covenant. This you shall do. You and your descendants, every generation shall obey all of those in your house who are coming after you. This is my covenant, which you shall perform between me and your descendants in every coming year. Every male child, yes, everyone bought or born shall be circumcised. Make sure you get this clear. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. It shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you therein. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations. This is the right that shall be exercised and thus you will be holy among the nations. He who is born in your house or one bought for a price, even if he is a foreigner and not your descendant, both alike shall be circumcised. The command is precise and on this right the covenant for you is dependent. Any uncircumcised male child that you have around, that person shall be cut off. On this you must stand your ground. Such a person shall be cut off from the people. He has broken my covenant and must be put away. Pass on this rule, shout it out from the steeple. The rule must not be broken. You shall do as I say. You see, the right looks forward to the coming one. The Messiah of the world will be born free from sin. I am sending through your line my only begotten son to reconcile the world to me for fellowship once again. This right is a picture of the incarnation, you see, when God will be clothed in robes of humanity and he will walk among the people to fulfill the law and in him will be perfection. There will be no flaw. Jesus, our God, it all points to you. Every word and picture in this sacred scroll, all praise, honor, and glory, you alone are due. And so we proclaim your worth with all our heart and soul. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the pictures and the types of the Old Testament which are fulfilled in the new and not just in a, a uncertain way, but in the most specific way of all by you sending your son, Jesus Christ, to live among us, to live the life that we cannot live. And then he gave that life up as a sacrifice and as a substitute for our own sins. We thank you for that. We ask that you help us in our Christian walks to grow in maturity and to follow you, to teach our children about you, and to proclaim your name and your goodness all the days of our lives. You're a great and wonderful Lord. We call on the name of Jesus. We receive him by faith, and we give you the praise and the honor and the glory that you alone are due, O oh God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.